Welcome to our Asteroid Day 2020 digital panel, Target Asteroid, How to Move an Incoming Space Rock. We know of more than a million asteroids, a small fraction of which cross Earth's orbit. Now, occasionally, orbit and Earth can be in the wrong place at the wrong time and take a hit. That's what happened in the Tunguska region of Siberia on the 30th of June, 1908. And that's the anniversary that we're actually marking with Asteroid Day. This panel is about the research that's going into the prevention of another strike. NASA's Double Asteroid Redirection Test Mission, or DART, and the European Space Agency's HERA mission will try to change the orbit of a small asteroid and then precisely measure its effects. NASA will crash the DART spacecraft into a small asteroid known as Didymos B or Didymoon. And then ESA's HERA spacecraft comes in to map the resulting impact crater and measure the asteroid's mass. HERA will also launch two CubeSats that will carry out crucial scientific studies before touching down on the asteroid's surface. Together with support from ground-based telescopes, this joint mission will begin the process of turning asteroid deflection into a well-understood planetary defense technique. I'm Alan Boyle, Aerospace and Science Editor for GeekWire, and joining me to talk about this fascinating subject today are Dr. Tom Jones, planetary scientist and NASA astronaut, Hannah Goldberg, a systems engineer at GOM Space in Aalborg, Denmark. Michelle Lavagna, a professor in flight mechanics at Politecnico di Milano. And Marco Fuchs, CEO and owner of the space technology company, OHB. Tom, deflecting an asteroid sounds like a pretty difficult thing to do. What are some of the options? Well, to deflect an asteroid away from a, a possible impact with Earth, you can think of the big problem as just making it miss its appointment with the Earth. So if we get early warning of an asteroid on a collision course with the Earth out 5, 10, 15 years, then that gives us time to develop a spacecraft and apply some of the techniques that have been talked about to deflect an asteroid. You know, the one that you've refer, uh, referenced already is called kinetic impact, where you basically shoot the asteroid with a, a bullet, a very high speed bullet, your spacecraft, and that transfers enough momentum, changing the speed or the velocity of the asteroid so that it shows up late or early for its appointment to smack the Earth. And so that transfer of momentum from the kinetic impact is what does the job. There are a couple of other practical alternatives. If you have a lot of lead time and the asteroid's fairly small, you can park your spacecraft right next to the big asteroid and then just hover there. And the mutual gravitational attraction between the asteroid and your little spacecraft is enough over a period of months or even years to pull or tug that little asteroid away from its appointment with Earth. So you make it show up early or you make it show up late and Earth goes unscathed. And then I think the final um, a Hollywood solution that we've all seen is the, uh, the nuclear explosive solution where you blast the asteroid with a, a nuclear device. And that actually has some good physics behind it but you don't wanna blow it into a million pieces like they do in the, in the movies. What you want to do is um, fry with a nuclear explosion one side of the asteroid. And that generates um, a puff of a, a giant jet of vapor coming off the asteroid from the intense heat, X-rays and neutrons of the uh, nuclear explosion. And that puff of vapor will shoot the asteroid in the opposite direction, just the Newton's third law. And again, you'll speed it up or slow the asteroid down and you make it miss its appointment with Earth. And then there's some other exotic techniques that we can talk about, but those are the three leading contenders right now. I have a feeling we're going to get back into the Hollywood solution a little bit later in this presentation. <laughs> but for now, could you tell us a little more about DART and what that's expected to do? Yeah, this is a, a mission that's very exciting, close to my heart. Uh, you know, I visited the space station. We had our asteroid, <laughs> we had our space station up there as our target, and our space shuttle took us to the, the space station. It required very precise navigation, very gentle closing rates to dock with the space station. Well, DART is the kinetic impact technique, and it doesn't come in closely, uh, very slowly and gently. It zooms right in at a speed of about six and a half kilometers per second. But the navigation techniques are similar to those that we use in human space flight. And also, uh, it's uh, applications from missile interceptions uh, technology that we can use to strike this asteroid. So DART 
is a, a small spacecraft about the size of a small automobile. And it's designed to launch next year in the summer of 2021. And then a, a little over a year after that, it's going to strike uh, a small moon around an asteroid called Didymos. And as you mentioned, the smaller satellite, Didymoon, which is only about 160 meters across, is the target for this demonstration. And the reason we chose to uh, NASA and the Applied Physics Lab, which is building the spacecraft, the reason they chose to not strike the big 800 meter uh, asteroid versus the small moonlet of 160 meters is because it's easier to measure a deflection uh, change in speed if you strike a smaller, less massive object. So the idea is to target this little satellite circling Didymos and then change its orbital period around the primary uh, about 10 minutes. And that 10 minute change in its orbit around the Didymos can be measured from Earth 7 million miles away in September of 22. Great. Now, Michelle, you're also involved uh, with the HERA mission uh, with the Italian CubeSat called Licia Cube. Could you tell us first what a CubeSat is and then how the Licia mission works with DART? Of course. Uh, so the uh, CubeSat is uh, basically a, a satellite, very small, so we are talking about uh, a size like uh, a shoebox, uh, but with the uh, capabilities of a complex uh, satellites as well. So the idea uh, with the uh, Licha Cube is basically to support uh, the DART mission. This is a CubeSat uh, mission based uh, and uh, uh, designed in Italy together with the collaboration of uh, the two national agencies. So NASA from one side for DART and the uh, Italian Space Agency from the other side. And uh, you can imagine that uh, if you have a satellite that is impacting on a stone in, in deep space, uh, nobody is going to see what is going to happen during the impact because the spacecraft is crashing on the, on the, uh, on the asteroids. So the role of this small uh, shoe uh, box uh, that uh, stays on the shoulder of DART uh, just uh, up to the arrival at the asteroids, and then is detached 10 days before, is to be the high of DART in some sense. So it will uh, witness uh, the impact of the satellites uh, on the asteroids, and will have the chance to collect images uh, of those few minutes uh, at the impact and after the impact. So this is a unique opportunity to the annotation asteroid occurring at the impact. And from the scientific point of view, this will help understanding the composition of the asteroids, the effects of the impact, and the behavior of DART during the asteroid's impacts as well. And this will be also, from the technological point of view, a very, uh, let's say, exciting uh, challenge because it's the first time that such a small spacecraft uh, will leave the environment of the Earth that is a bit protected uh, from the harsh uh, environment and will experience uh, the complexity of the deep space. Uh, so challenging from the science, but also from the technological point of view. Fantastic. That sounds like a great show to look forward to. Uh, several years after the impact, there will be another show when the HERA mission arrives to take follow-up readings. Marco, you and your company have a big responsibility in this mission because OHB is the prime contractor. Tell us what that means and what the spacecraft will do. Yes, thanks, Alan. Yeah, uh, we're very happy as OHB that we have been selected as the prime contractor for the HERA mission. That's a European mission funded by the European Space Agency, ESA. It's led by German industry and there was a competition some time ago where OHB was able to succeed. So we're very happy to have that responsibility. And of course, as we heard earlier, uh, that's the European contribution. And then later on, we will visit uh, um, the asteroids and we will measure the impact that DART uh, uh, has on the asteroid. And uh, of course, we're trying to then, uh, uh, or the scientific payloads are trying to then measure and establish exactly um, what was uh, the success, how DART impacted the uh, the asteroid, the smaller of, of, of the two asteroids. Uh, and Europe, um, together, 13 countries are jointly funding that mission. Um, so it's exciting because it has a very tight schedule because we have to make that, uh, that uh, launch date. Uh, and it was only decided last November. So we heard from Thomas that the DART mission will launch already uh, in the summer of 21. So we are coming late, but we have to make sure that we are reaching the asteroids because they are moving away from 
from Earth. So distance is getting bigger, so we need to speed up and be on time. Fantastic. In addition to its own suite of instruments, Hira will be carrying two CubeSats that it'll deploy once it arrives at Didymos. One of those CubeSats is called Juventus, and that's the mission that you're working on, Hannah. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about that mission? Sure, happy to. Um, so Juventus is another uh, what's called a six-unit CubeSat, so very similar to the shoebox size of the Lucia CubeSat that was talked about uh, earlier. Um, and so what we will do is, is Hera will um, do all of the work in, in getting us to the asteroid, so we don't need to do that ourselves. And, and once there, drop off uh, Juventus into the Didymos asteroid system. Um, uh, we will provide the really exciting measurement of uh, the first ever uh, information regarding the interior of an asteroid. We do that with um, our primary payload is a low frequency radar. And that radar has the ability to penetrate inside the asteroid and, and tell us about its interior composition. So is it made of one big monolithic structure or a bunch of different smaller rocks? And this uh, uh, interior probing uh, through the radar measurements will be able to give us a lot of information um, uh, to complement that of, of the HERA observations to tell us how these binary asteroids are formed and, and a little bit more about them. Um, well, I'm glad to get the correct pronunciation for Juventus, so I, I, I appreciate that. And you're also working on another standalone CubeSat mission called MRGO. Tell us about the goals for that particular spacecraft and the challenges that you face as you're trying to get it into space. Yep. So MRGO will, um, is a slightly larger size, about the size of a, a small microwave oven. Uh, and, and what it will do is uh, uh, be the first ever uh, CubeSat mission to be standalone by itself to an asteroid. So uh, in many of these other missions like Lucia Cube and Juventus, uh, we ride along with a bigger spacecraft that does the work in the deep space navigation. And Amargo has a very high performance electric propulsion system. So it will still piggyback on the launch vehicle uh, rocket with a, a much bigger spacecraft, but it will stay in what's called a parking orbit and wait and until and it's the correct time to depart to, to head to a different asteroid target. So like many of these other bigger missions, we don't necessarily know which asteroid we'll go to yet. Uh, we'll be a bit flexible and have some candidates, uh, but based on our launch time, uh, we can then use our electric propulsion system to navigate to an asteroid ourselves uh, and be completely independent uh, in operations. Great. Michelle, one of your specialties is uh, trying to figure out uh, how to navigate around asteroids. What are the challenges for that and, and what are you learning about how to do it? So it's a really a challenge to stay nearby an object that you have to think is not known very precisely since the beginning. So you are uh, going in the proximity of a natural uh, object like the asteroids are that you don't know quite well in shape, you don't know the dynamics of these objects, and you roughly know your positions because uh, navigating in deep space is still a challenge and it's still something that is not done autonomously. And the risk that you add to this uh, is that you are in proximity of a small bodies, and proximity mean, means uh, around a kilometers or less, uh, even meters, a hundred of meters. So the chance to hit it uh, is very um, uh, is very high, and therefore you have to identify ways, uh, practical ways, from the technology and the software point of view that allows you understanding quite uh, quickly because you have no time to solve the problem where you. Uh, precisely are with respect to the soil of the asteroids as well to run your science of course but also to protect you from the risk of impacting as mentioned so in that sense uh, uh, the optical uh, uh, navigation so using uh, a technique that is like uh, our eyes uh, of course enhanced with respect to the performance of a human beings uh, is uh, one of the most promising not the only one is a fusion of uh, sensors and data to be collected but this is a way uh, the, the way to, to pave uh, for that. Great. Uh, the fantastic thing about this panel is that there's so much going on with asteroids and, and we've been talking about Hera and, and DART, but uh, there's a lot more. Uh, and, and Marco, uh, you're working not only with Hera, but also with uh, an ESA mission called the Fly-Eye Telescope. Can you tell us a little bit more about your involvement in that mission? Yes. 
um, uh, of course, the FLY telescope is a telescope that is uh, based on Earth uh, and uh, looks uh, out to the universe, uh, searching for asteroids. Uh, and that is obviously um, uh, the, the other angle you can take. So we, are, we, are, we built the first uh, of these telescopes that is uh, installed in Italy. And uh, we're uh, preparing for a few more to do that. And obviously, um, um, you need to monitor asteroids uh, from Earth so that you can detect them. Uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, is very active with a number of programs in that uh, respect. And uh, building the HERA mission uh, in Germany, we're very happy to, to build the uh, fly eye uh, telescopes from our Italian branch in Milano. So we're trying to be helpful from both sides uh, of the angle. Tom, I wanted to get back to Hollywood uh, and uh, the, the whole uh, popular conception of uh, the, the threat that asteroids pose and also what to do about them. You've been in this game for, for quite a while. Uh, tell us uh, what, uh, what the public probably should know and doesn't, they don't know about uh, the asteroid threat and the, uh, the promise of asteroids. Oh, that's a great topic. I wish we had another half an hour to go into it all in great detail. But yeah, you know, the Earth has been bombarded by um, cosmic debris, uh, creating craters on the surface of the Earth for the last 4.5 billion years, just as long as we've been a planet. The moon shows that evidence. Uh, it's our nearest neighbor in space, and we can see all of those pock marks on the moon, those craters that have been created by this very same bombardment. Earth is just a more dynamic planet that renews itself and renews its crust, and so you don't see more than 190 craters or so that we know about on Earth today. But it's a global hazard. Uh, small objects do run into us periodically. In the terms of one human's lifespan, not a big problem. Uh, we don't even know in history of anyone who's actually been killed by an asteroid impact. However, over the course of our species and over the course of a thousand years, there will be enough uh, impacts on the Earth that could cause us as a society a problem. So for example, just um, from our satellite data, we know that about 30 times a year, there's a Hiroshima-sized blast uh, of, of an asteroid impact in the atmosphere. It doesn't make it to the ground or make a crater, but that blast occurs about 30 times a year from cosmic debris. So if a bigger one comes through, bigger, bigger than about 40 meters, it can make it all the way to the ground and cause damage to a city or a region. And we have to look ahead to define those objects and warn us of that pending threat, do something about them. Great. Uh, Hannah, uh, I, I wanted to play off that to, uh, to talk about uh, uh, how uh, asteroids could be a resource as well as a threat that I know you were involved with Planetary Resources, which is a, a company that uh, aimed to uh, aim to take advantage of those space resources uh, and, uh, and uh, maybe was ahead of its time, but, but that's certainly something that is a long range possibility for, for humanity. Uh, how, how do you balance the uh, methods to avoid asteroids with the methods to actually get to those asteroids and take advantage of them? Yeah, sure. So uh, the exciting thing is that uh, just the fact that more and more of these asteroid missions exist, uh, every time, uh, we've sent a uh, spacecraft to an asteroid, we've, we've learned something new about them. Uh, and so the more of these missions that we, we get to uh, learn more about the formation of the asteroid, the composition of the asteroids, um, uh, we can use them not only for planetary protection purposes, but also for um, uh, exploration and, and uh, potential utilization of, of uh, the types of resources they may have. So and one exciting one is, is the, uh, the potential of having water and, and what that does for, for space exploration and opening up uh, a number of opportunities there. Uh, but that's why a mission like the Amargo spacecraft is, is uh, so enticing because um, you can have a very small spacecraft go out and, and uh, quite cheaply with the low cost operations compared to these much larger missions that take many, many years in the making. Um, you can start sending these little exploration craft to, to more asteroids and learn more about them and uh, be precursor missions to find out uh, what type of, of uh, materials may exist. 
Michelle, I wanted to ask you um, what the frontier for, uh, for studying asteroids and, and finding ways to head them off might be. Are, are there new uh, scientific perspectives that are coming to the light because of uh, the studies that you and other people are conducting? I would say that uh, the, uh, the techniques uh, for pushing them off that has been mentioned by Tom are those that uh, are uh, uh, in line and the more uh, promising. I would say that there are some fancy other techniques that are not uh, so scientifically valuable or technologically feasible. I think that the new frontiers from the asteroids point of view is uh, somehow related with uh, what Anna mentioned. So the uh, exploitations of asteroids uh, from the scientific point of view uh, to understand uh, the, uh, the origin of life. Uh, so understanding and visiting those asteroids that are coming from very far, so object uh, from the Kuiper belt. So the belt that stays at the limit of our solar uh, system uh, that are really difficult uh, to to get in. So this is the real uh, frontier from the science. While from the technology, uh, the frontier is the mining and the exploitations of the resources of those objects that are not so easy to uh, land on because of lack of gravity. They are small. They sometimes are. Um, plenty of voids uh, because they are a resemble of other stones uh, put in together because of the dynamics of the gravity. And therefore to land, uh, stay there, drilling, scoping, getting the resources is, is really not easy because you touch the object and you, you are bounced back uh, because you are not retained on the soil. And this opens a door to a lot of uh, applied science uh, that becomes technology for industry in the next uh, decades. Uh, that is really exciting. Great, uh, and that leads me to Marco. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, the uh, about the future of uh, missions to asteroids. Is this something that OHB intends to make a habit out of? And and if we did need to divert an asteroid, how quickly could a mission be put together to do it? Well, obviously, um, um, the, the last question depends on uh, the, the approach of the asteroid. So, of course, we have to speed up if we see it very late uh, because we need to uh, be there before it hits Earth. So, I, I guess one of the real challenges here is that there is a, a very firm schedule element in that. Um, and this sounds a little bit like Hollywood, but that's really, if it becomes a, a, a real threat and there's the, the danger that an asteroid is approaching Earth, that defines the, the timing. Um, what we can see uh, on this DART HERA mission is uh, that uh, America and Europe works together, it's coordinated. So in case there ever comes a, a situation where it's really unclear if an asteroid um, uh, is a threat to Earth, of course, uh, I think the world would pull together and would define um, multiple efforts to, to do that. Great. Uh, Tom, I wanted to turn to you for the last question because you're, you're an astro astronaut. You've had this experience of uh, seeing the Earth from space and, and getting that uh, high altitude perspective. Uh, and in fact, uh, at one time, NASA was planning on doing a mission that would send astronauts to an, a near-Earth asteroid. Uh, I'd love to hear your perspective on uh, the uh, on the possibility of uh, actually sending people to these asteroids and, and what it would be like. Is that something that, that you could imagine yourself doing? Well, I'd love to sign up for a mission like that, Alan. It's uh, like exciting to think that the more we learn about asteroids from a planetary defense perspective and from a scientific perspective, the more that feeds into our ability to use their resources and use their uh, physical locations in space as really literally stepping stones out to Mars, for example. So we're going to operate, I hope, on the moon in the next five years and learn some more about operating on another, on another planet. But Mars is a different proposition, very much more difficult to get to. That search for life out there is a reason to go to Mars, but it's, it's going to take a two to three year mission. Lots of hazards along the way. Maybe some smaller steps out towards Mars visiting the nearby asteroids would give us the experience, the vital risk reduction that we would need to make it safe for humans to plunge out into the, the depths of the solar system to Mars. So 
if we go to a small asteroid, we get not only a scientific bonanza and maybe tap into water resources on that asteroid for the future, but we also learn how to operate around small, very low gravity bodies like the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. So we might think of an asteroid mission relatively close to the Earth, maybe a few months out, a few months back, as a way to rehearse for the larger campaigns of exploring Mars. That is such a fantastic point that we're talking about asteroids today for Asteroid Day, but it's really not just about asteroids. It's about exploration and, and uh, protecting the Earth and, and taking advantage of space resources. And, and I'm so glad we had a chance to touch on all of that uh, during today's panel. Uh, thank you so much to our speakers for uh, their insights into this big topic. Uh, probably the one thing that uh, the general public knows about asteroids is that they might be able to kill us someday. And so we don't want to go the way of the dinosaurs. We want to find a way to use science and technology to, to keep things going and, and push out into the broader cosmos. And so thank you so much for being part of this panel and thanks to our viewers for uh, sticking with us and uh, and learning more about asteroids. And, and so uh, have a great asteroid day. Watch the other presentations that are online. And uh, until next time, watch the skies. <laughs>